My talk today is dedicated to a metaphor that most of us use for convenience that turns out to be an obstacle to intelligibility in the humanity. This metaphor lays in the word influence, and as I made it clear from the title of this lecture, my ambition is to get us rid of it once and for all. Why? Some of you might think the term influence is useful. Uh, it meant to describe an undetermined zone a gray area where determinisms do not apply in a mechanical way. We use it to get a hold on weak links. Uh, and it's that sense uh, that we talk, for example, of the influence of Cezanne on Picasso, or of Descartes on Spinoza, Spinoza on Leibniz, or Leibniz on Borges, or on Greek, Greek architecture on Franck Claude Wright. Well, I can find no discipline in the humanities where the word is not in use. This is why I chose a painting here to start uh, of Orpheus. We don't know how Orpheus' music can make the stones fly, but it is attested that his music has spectacular effects without us knowing how this magic actually works. It's pretty much the same with influence. We, we use the term, we kind of bet there is an influence between A and B, but we strictly don't know how this works. As a matter of fact, there are also many other areas when they talk of influence. In psychology, for example, influence is a process in which a person makes others adopt beliefs that they would not have adopted in a spontaneous movement. In politics, influence aims to change the behavior of a certain target, be an individual or group, without resorting to coercion or constraint. So in this context, I admit this word can actually have a meaning, but I would like to argue that in the humanities, it is useless and extremely easy to avoid. I could actually demonstrate this very quickly, like in two minutes, but I will not. The reason why I think that influence is worth studying precisely is because it introduces an incoherence in our common way of considering time and history. As I will argue from that starting point, we can totally reverse our frame of mind. So here is how I will proceed. I would like to quickly remember what influence means in ancient astrology, where the term originates from. And then in the contemporary communication theories where it is generally used. And then, the way we talk of influence in the humanities will appear very clearly as insufficient and evitable. I might even say a word about an alternative model in a third section of my talk. But the most important part of what I have to say today is the final one, when a closer look of what is at stake will lead us to a conception of time and history very different from the good old chronological linearity. So, my first part is called Logics of Influence, the mild action known by, by its effects. As I said, we can draw influence back to several traditions, but I will tackle only two of them. One is the oldest, the other is the most recent. Uh, astrology, as you know, is based on the interpretation of the correspondences between celestial configurations and terrestrial affairs. If it considers the position of the planets, it is called a tropical zodiac. If it considers that of the stars, it's called a sidereal zodiac, sorry. Now, at first, astrology was concerned only with the destiny of the whole world, and it was called uh, world astrology. The first individual astral themes appeared in a cuneiform text dating from 419 BC with a reference to 12 listed signs. So in this context, uh, the term influence describes the action of celestial bodies on terrestrial bodies. And this discipline is actually nothing <coughs> absurd. And if it is in no way scientific, it's not because it's false, irrational, or superstitious, but it's because it's based on the form of necessity. It's not based on the form of necessity we call causality. The celestial bodies are signs to be read 
And this is all the point of astrology. It is something you should read. How, how it works, astrologists don't know. So, uh, since I want to be brief, I'll make a quick synthesis from what I gathered from uh, the bibliography on astrology. So I won't go into uh, Melanchthon and Kepler and Jacob Boehm and Paracelsus and whoever. I just want to summarize what an influence is in this tradition. An influence is an action that is primarily continuous and its variations are regular and smooth. Obviously, it's, it's, it's comparable to the movements of the planets and of the stars. It happens without intention from either parties. So this is very much unlike the ancient gods. That is, the stars and the planets, they don't actually intend to make you do something. They just sort of can't help their influence and you can't help to receive their influence, but you certainly can liberate yourself from the nocive influence of a planet, and if you do, you'll feel more free. And thirdly, this action occurs at a distance. That is to say, you can describe its action without having any certainty about its means. Most of the astrologists considered that human beings were not able to understand them. So you know there is an influence because you can sort of read the two texts, the text in the stars or in the, in the celestial bodies and what the, the earthly events, but you don't know what exactly relates them. Therefore, the concept of influence works in astrology as a black box. That is, you, what, 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 import, what is important is not how it works, it's the focus is on, on the effect, what comes out of it, and not on its particular mechanism. So it's a double text reading, that's the reason for this image, uh, taken from uh, an edition uh, from the 17th century of Robert Flood's work. You can see the astrologist is reading uh, the sky, and he's um, in dialogue with the person who wanted to know things about his own life. So there is sort of a double text reading, as I was saying, and influence is more of an harmonic correspondence than a causal link. It considers, once again, the coherence of elements belonging to the same cosmos, although their actual relationships remain unobservable and inintelligible. It allows us to describe the interactions that do not meet the requirements of causality although some authors, such as Johannes Kepler, did try to make this concept fit in their own physics. Okay, now, in the communication theory, influence allows to evaluate the credit of someone's opinion on other people. As you know, some voices are more important than others. Some are more influential, they are what are called influentials in English, and in French it's more opinion leaders, leader d'opinion. This actually originated in a two-step flow theory of communication that has a long history and many variations since Gabriel Tard, but a seminal book was Personal Influence, published in 1955 in New York by Elihu Katz and Paul Lazarfeld. So Katz and Lazarfeld made a major point by claiming that you do not impact someone mechanically just by saying something, even with great persuasive power, even when you have vast means, even you if, if you broadcast it on a very large scale. Why? Because influence lays in a very complex relationship between transmitters and receivers. It is the self-commitment in acts or beliefs that counts, and the mechanics of, commi of commitment are very complex. Many years later, the influence marketing has replaced propaganda and advertising. As you know, this, this image is taken from unknown. I really wanted to make this uh, appear because it's very interesting uh, uh, when it comes to the sort of reference you can make. It's all about influence uh, today. It's, you don't even know where it comes from, 
But to me, this, this design is the best I could find on the internet. And it, it, it's, you can feel like uh, after, in the digital area, in the digital era, sorry, social networks, ad blockers, and the gradual loss of confidence of the population have totally recomposed the channels between the organizations and their customers or citizens. So it has become very complex. And uh, as you can understand, in this context, influence is mainly a detour. That is, if your goal is to make someone adopt a belief, your goal will be achieved only if you go to indirect links. So you should first target someone else if you want someone to believe something. You should not go directly to your target. And when the authors come to specify the modalities of influence building, other concepts always take over. In the media, there are so many forms of influence that actually influence becomes a synonym for uh, power. Influence is just a form of power in, in, in communication theory, and many authors use the one for the other. It means pretty much the same thing. And it, again, it's a form of power that relies on indirect and numerous links from A to B, and not on something very direct. And thirdly, that's a very important point, it rejects the clear opposition between active and passive. This is, we know that since personal influence. Okay, from here, I want to let you see a shortcut in this talk. We could actually end it right, right now in a few minutes after we've read uh, this quote from Michael Baxendal, as you know, the great art historian in his book, Patterns of Intention, published in 1985 where he wrote a chapter called Excursus Against Influence. And it reads as follows. Influence is a curse of art criticism, primarily because of its wrong-headed grammatical prejudice about who is the agent and who the patient. It seems to reverse the active-passive relationship which the historical actor experiences and the inferential beholder he'll wish to account. This is a very brilliant observation because, as a matter of fact, the way influence is used in the humanities doesn't seem to consider the active part of the receiver. At least it doesn't account for it. Uh, but if this remark is interesting, you must admit you cannot get rid of magical thinking just by saying it is a curse. So, rather than get art history rid of influence, let me first make a plea for influence against art historians. Alberti Giorgio Vasari uh, wrote a biographical collection called The Lives of the Best Painters, Sculptors, and Architects. His second edition of uh, 1568 is considered one of the founding publications of in Israel art. As the title makes clear, this history is based on a selection. Vasari pretends to present and study only the best actors of this history. And for that reason, it focuses on certain artists he considered as outstanding. So it's basic, it's not history, it's basically a book about geniuses. Now, once you have artificially isolated these figures, what could possibly be the relationships between them? Because there are obvious historical relationships. Some have trained others, some imitate others, etc. Now, the relation between these brilliant singularities is conceived as a relation of influence. So, uh, in a way, influence is not a curse, it's a cure. It means it is meant to reestablish links in a narrative that has conceptually excluded them. You see, we, if you start with isolated figures that are geniuses, 
you cannot relate them to one another if you don't have this weak link coming back and uh, in a subterranean way. So it influence restores the interactions that have been cut apart in the process of selection. Now, Vasari's problem and solution were pretty much met in the same terms in other fields. Wherever the figures of artists or authors and sometimes even books or artworks or theories were made into islands, influences were immediately considered as the sea currents and the tectonics that connected these islands. In the humanities, here are the requirements of uh, influence. First, there has to be a chronological antecedents of A on B. Otherwise, there would be a constellation, as Dieter Heinrich puts it. Secondly, you have you got to have an observable similarity that is only common to A and B, to the exclusion of the other elements of the same field. And thirdly, in particular in the 21st century, scholars consider it compulsory that the relationship between two authors or two artists should be attested. Otherwise, the influence should remain uh, speculative. So you can only speak of the influence of one author on another if and only if you can prove that the latter has read or seen or met the former. That is, if there is a direct link. So this is the case, for example, uh, between Cezanne and Picasso. Picasso, we know Picasso admired Cezanne very much. He saw his paintings. And as you can see, there is an obvious resemblance between the buildings uh, in front of the, the Saint Victoire mountain and the treatment of, of their volumes in Luzin uh, Orta de Ebro by Picasso. Right. At this point, uh, I guess the, the, the very idea of influence has come into a crisis. You might feel proud of the humanities giving a certain consistency to the concept, but the problem is that influence has become inconsistent with its first meaning. Three points. If we look back at astrology, we see that the humanities tend to pull influence toward the visible side of things. The rational matrix we use tend to support an asserted influence by a maximum of observable determinations. But the concept of influence was meant to describe an invisible link, unobservable, something that was not offered to the eye. So when we want to assign it uh, objective value, we raise endless and tedious controversies. These are such as uh, when scholars uh, 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 debate about the influences on Spinoza, for example, or like, is Hebrew theology more important than uh, Cartesian philosophy? Well, it's exactly the type of debate that leads nowhere. You cannot decide anything about this. It doesn't make any sense, actually. Second, if we look back at the communication theory, we know that influence cannot be direct and depends on many factors. And so it's very strange that this term should be used to describe a very clear and a very plain link between, in that case, Cezanne and Picasso. And eventually, in astrology, it is obvious that the astrologist plays a key role in the process. Incomprehensible and invisible actions become meaningful through an interpreter. It is only by his science that the positions of the stars or of the planets can tell you something about your own life. Therefore, I ask, isn't an art lover and her audience needed to help the influences make sense could it be thinkable that her intervention should be needed just as the soothsayer only can make the prediction? So let's see if we can purge the, the curse uh, by studying some alternatives. Actually, there are so many alternatives to influence from 
affiliation to borrowing that I cannot comment on all of them. But I like one very much, and that's the reason why I'm, I'm going to study it uh, more thoroughly. This one considers that one actor of a field has made something possible for its successor to do. So it's what I call possibilization. The former is considered to have made the letter possible from the innovations of a certain author of artist, other innovations become acceptable, which were not before. Right. This model implies that from a certain state of the field, like this very branch as at the beginning of this design, the norms of the field should extend as an anomaly is being introduced by an actor. Okay, and as time goes by, some other actors introduce other anomalies so that the norms keep on splitting and multiplying so that the possible uh, options go on extending. This model implies that from, uh, yeah, sorry, I, I've already read that, that sentence. Of course, this suggests a strongly oriented history where progress is irreversible and unilaterally ratified. In the curse of evolution, we could follow a repetitive deployment of possibilities, some sort of growing tree of standards, as you can see, that would never stop growing more and more options, except, of course, in the case of conservative periods when a political power can actually reduce and go back to normativity and restrain creativity. Now, I think this image is beautiful and it's interesting to comment on, but there are very serious objections to this vision of history. First, it presents the progressive diversification of a single twig that was arbitrarily isolated. Because, of course, if you start with just one twig, you can show that it's, it, it goes on splitting. But how on earth did you pick just one twig to study? Uh, if you imagine a very coherent and univoc normativity at the bottom, at the start, you might invent a narrative that extends its possibilities in time, but they might have existed all along. As my, my friends uh, studying um, philosophy, medieval philosophy, when I talk about modern philosophy, they always say, oh, this existed already back in the, the 12th century. You know? And it's like, it, it, so the problem is isolating a certain tradition and, and draw a line that will extend just because you get out of your first uh, idea of unifying a tradition. Actually, I always say to my students, tradition is not a term that should be used uh, as a singular. There is no such thing as a tradition. There are traditions. <clears throat> Moreover, it is only when you observe something realized that you consider its possibilization back in time. Of course, so what appears at, as possible comes only from its realization. So we could call this a structural anachronism. The possible is only perceived as realized. In other words, it never had the status of something possible before it was actualized, before it ceased to be possible. So as you can see, the possibilization hypothesis disregards the way this interpretation works. And I'm not saying it doesn't work uh, or it's wrong because it is based on anachronism. I claim it is a very interesting lead to rethink what is anachronism. Why? Well, because as I already said, possibilization goes backwards in time. And that is why it helps me 
uh, in correcting what we think an influence is. If influence is to make sense, it is precisely when its meaning goes counterclockwise. Let us consider it uh, like a relation between three terms, A, B, and C. In a first approach, the model is the following. Influence is an invisible, indirect action of A on B. So I put it into brackets here because we don't actually know how it works. We don't know uh, what are the mechanics, but because again, it's invisible, but we know something is going on between A and B. Of course, this becomes visible and meaningful when C can observe both B and A and that she can affirm there is a link that nobody had seen before, maybe not even B, and that it exists. So where is influence palpable and objective? Well, it is precisely in C's speech. Because it is by hypothesis the only one to be able to observe the influence A doesn't know about her influence, B doesn't, isn't always aware of the influence, but C is able to compare both A and B and to express explicitly the influence. Right. Of course, you will say that B herself can affirm the influence of A on her, but that she could establish consciously this relation. So let's study another case. When B is explicitly uh, assuming an influence on, of A on her, when B explicits the influence A had on her, this is called a reference. Okay, this is when B considers A, that she makes A an element that can be explicit or that can be implicit of her own speech. So, as, so that's the reason why I use the, the yellow color, because it's, it's a matter of speech. She's explicit, B is explicitly saying, oh, I reckon uh, my debt, put it that way, um, to A, because A influenced me very much. So there still is this idea of an action from A to B, but that is in B speech. Uh, in that case, the so-called influence is nothing of an unobservable indirect action. It is an explicit reference by which B is elaborating her work through A, that is through a reference to A. So at the end of the day, when C goes back talking about an influence going from A to B, one must admit the term influence is nothing but the inverted paraphrase of a more or less explicit reference. It's the same thing. It's just that you, you, you make it, uh, you just invert it, it, its direction. Again, I don't see anything here comparable to what the astrologist and what the media theorists study. Now, if we want to correct the way C expresses what she observes between A and B, the famous blurred links or weak links that influence is supposed to describe, we only need to reverse time. If C agrees to correctly describe what B does with A, she will find out that B <coughs> refers to A in order to become B. Okay, so it's in fact a circular speech. It's a figure. It's a circular figure. It, that's that's what a reference is. You 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 refer to someone else to become yourself. Okay, but this circularity is extremely precious to me because it can help us emancipate history from astral themes. Uh, 
but you, as you can see from this, this drawing, C needs to accept that it's only going backward to describe something that B does going backwards too, okay? So that's when we come to the bumpy part. So fasten your seatbelts. Of course, this inversion of, uh, from influence to reference has many advantages. It turns its objects observable and it no longer supposes the unexp unexplainable, devastating force of a work on passive receptors. It doesn't make someone responsible of something he had nothing to do with, like Cezanne didn't invent cubism at all. Okay. But please don't think the inversion solves everything. The reference is not the solution. The reference is the genuine form of the influence problem. Why is there a reference? How is the reference being made? To what extent is there exactly a reference? There are so many modes of references. Uh, just to give one example, a, prob a very problematic reference is, is uh, uh, in Tarantino's Kill Bill to uh, Truffaut's film, uh, The Bright Wall Black. Actually, Tarantino declared he never saw the movie. The problem is the two movies ha have obvious similarities. So you, you, you get to the point when you really have to think he's a liar. Otherwise, there is some special force that has made reference in Kill Bill to another movie that the very director didn't know. And so we, we, we so what I mean to say is that as it stands, the study of references makes the humanities more rational and more interesting than any debate on the so-called influences. But again, so again, I just wanted to take this example to, 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 let, to make it clear that the reference is problematic. It's, not, it's, it's in no way a solution, but it, 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 makes it, it gives you a direction. But what interested me more is that this direction is, is abnormal when it comes to time. Um, again, we have the opportunity here to become fully aware of the historical time frame we actually draw. And so I shall present it very shortly as an alternative to the arrow of time. So here is a typical chronology of events. Uh, we could think of, say, so it goes from E1 to E5, and we could think of, say, E1 is Descartes, and then uh, Regius, and then Spinoza, then Chilnhaus, and then Leibniz. But to make it more simple, let's do it another way. Let's imagine in E1, two people meet and fall in love, and see what, what happens in the, uh, in the course of the event, what, what can occur to them. If in E2, uh, one of the two lovers meets someone else and falls in love with someone else, then E1 was just an affair of uh, nighttime. Now, if in E2 they move together, then E1 becomes the starting point of a relationship. Okay? So, this is very important to me because it means that in E2, when you go back to E1, you don't just formulate a secondary interpretation. Actually, it's not just an interpretation. It is the causal value of E1 that changes according to what happens in E2. So that is why the interpretation is an actual retroaction. Many alternative events are being erased when you read E1 back from E2. Actually, you could have... Uh, anyway, this is, this is very simple, so I don't have to comment on this. Let's go on. 
let's imagine that in E3 uh, they marry, they get married, and E4 they have children, and in E5 they divorce. Uh, of course, at each and every point, the significance of E1 varies constantly and significantly between E2 and E5. Oh, you know, that was the day when I met your mother. Or that was the day when I met her and I hate her. That was the worst day of my life. Or, well, it happened. It was the starting point of my first marriage. I remember that, you know, peacefully. So e each time, uh, there are feedback loops on the very same event, but then it is very clear from my drawing that if you take into account all these different loops, E1 was nothing of a certain position on a straight line. It was a very ambiguous event that once you see all these retroactions in the same plan, you can see it was very multiple, actually. And these possibilities, so to speak, were realized at different points of time, okay? But again, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I, I'm very reluctant to use this possible terminology because what I'm trying to, to say here is that these multiple in, uh, retroactions let the original non-linearity appear, okay? So each retroaction actually recomposes the continuity from its own perspective. Now, if we go on with this drawing, I will just get rid of the colors and let appear that each event is susceptible of the same type of retroaction, okay? So it's pretty much the same drawing, but I'm making it clear that uh, uh, each retroaction recomposes the continuity from its own perspective, okay, but it will be reconsidered in turn according to other perspectives, okay? So why did I erase the, the arrow of time here? Well, it's because I saw it, I saw it appearing as I was drawing because as you can see, the actual continuity is not a predetermination of the whole system, it's one of the effects of the various retroactions. That's how you actually build the continuity. It's the impression given by the accumulation of retroactions that gives the, the impression that it's continuous. So actually, studies in history, history of arts, of literature, of philosophy, go backwards counterclockwise. So what we do is that when we study any type of reference, so reference of Descartes in Spinoza, for example, like I, myself being E5, studying back Spinoza, let's make it E3, himself referring to Descartes in E1, we're all going backwards in time. So, and it's not only the actors of a story that can change it, but also the ones who tell the story. It is to historians to evaluate the historical value and even the historical coordinates of any points by referring it to various events of the past. And as you can see, the causal links we will draw between the events in the normal sense of the, uh, the arrow of time are nothing but inverted projections of references going, in fact, backwards. So this means that historical time cannot be represented as a simple arrow going from past to present, but as a recursive, never-ending process that is basically this. As you can see, it, it's, it's pretty much the same image. Uh, what, what you saw from here which is the plain image we have of time, to hear one retroaction, to hear several retroactions, to hear various interactional retroactions to that is pretty much the same thing. But this seems to me a very much more accurate 
image of what time actually is. So when you face this type of time scheme, you realize that a rational history is not intended to reconstruct patterns of causality. That is to say, to go in the direction of the arrow of time, it is a regressive process that expresses the existence of an interactional temporality. So this doesn't mean that we can get rid of objectivity and we can tell any story we want. It's quite on the contrary. If we want to maintain objectivity and intelligibility, we must admit that history is no longer a linear phenomenon, but a never-ending process of recursive loops in which none of the poles of the interaction is completely fixed. In that sense, we do not travel through time in the sense we believe. Actually, we do not travel at all when we read ancient authors or look at ancient paintings. We play in time in many ways, just as in waves, as you can imagine these waves of time. But this is the topic of my next talk, uh, the lunch talk we'll have next Monday at noon, at noon at the programming translation, the, the, the turbulences. For today, some conclusions to take home. Uh, whenever you are tempted to talk about influence, I beg you not to do so and to correct yourself by accepting that historians or in the humanities in general, but when we, when we look back in history, we are only looking backwards so that we should indeed talk about reference. And we should avoid influence in humanities for three reasons. First, you reverse what you observe. You transform objective, observable similarities from B to A into unobservable, intersubjective pseudo-causalities from A to B. It is useless. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything and it does not lead you anywhere. Second, you simplify a very ambiguous set of multiple significations. So some other human being left some work behind and you can enrich your reference to it by other references if you think it's fruitful to you and to others. But if you simplify it, of course you can be dogmatic and damage your interactions. And you don't want to do that. Thirdly, when you talk about influence, you project something you are actually doing. That is actually a reference, because you're referring to authors or to artists or whatever. And a reference is the elaboration of meaningful interactions. So when you comment on it, you interact with it, and you modify its value and effects. So these are three reasons why you shouldn't uh, destroy what you're actually trying to do, that is to interact both with the past and with your actual audience, your present audience. And so I guess I did enough talking for today. It's now time for you to interact with me. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.